Well, welcome everybody, and uh, excuse me for not standing up to address you all in church, because welcome also to those who are joining us online uh, through the, uh, the Zoom, and also I think on, we're streaming on YouTube as well, so we are in all kinds of public spaces all at once in this new hybrid world in which we find ourselves. Welcome to those of you who have not been here before to St Andrew by the Wardrobe. I'm Father Luke Miller, the Rector here. Uh, and it's uh, wonderful me, for me once again to welcome His Eminence, Archbishop Angelos, to be with us uh, this afternoon and for us to uh, enter into a, a conversation. This is not our first conversation. We've had lots of conversations, he and I, in different contexts, uh, but this is the first one that we've done in quite this well. Uh, just to say a couple of uh, parish notices before we start. Uh, we have now reached uh, the so-called Freedom Day, and uh, the thanks to uh, Laura, our indefatigable uh, uh, parish administrator for uh, preparing our risk assessment, uh, under which you are, believe it or not, all, all gathered. And so please do feel free either to wear or not to wear your face coverings as you feel most comfortable uh, during uh, this afternoon. Please do be careful of one another's social distancing and uh, please don't impose on people's space uh, if they feel that uh, uh, that, 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 that they would rather that you didn't. So please just assume that you should maintain social distancing until somebody invites you any nearer. And uh, the other couple of things to say are that I hope that very much that afterwards you will be able in a social distance way to gather uh, for those, those of you who are here in three dimensions uh, for a glass of something uh, which will be in the narthex afterwards where you will be able to view the twin displays that are currently there to represent the twin way of working that we're looking forward to initiating. There is a display of the extraordinary work of the Coptic Youth Project, and uh, there are some t-shirts there, uh, one of which I would love to have, um, which is keep calm and keep the faith. I think I want one of those. And uh, there's an, also a display, uh, which um, Tom Ormond, one of our church wardens has put together, showing a little bit of the history of St. Andrew by the wardrobe, uh, which sets in context the conversation that we're about to have. And that history is that this church has been here since the 12th century, certainly, and possibly since the 11th century, when it was known as St. Andrew next to the castle. For Bernard's castle was here, which was the fort on the Roman walls where the Roman wall met the river in the east, which mirrors the fort, the Tower of London, where, uh, in the west, I beg your pardon, where in the, in the Tower of London, of course, in the east. Uh, and then uh, over the centuries, uh, the name of the church changed because of the establishment of the King's Wardrobe, which was just built just behind the church, just behind the east wall of the church. And it became St. Andrew by the Wardrobe, that wonderful name by which we are still known throughout the world. And the church was lost in the Great Fire of London and was the last of the churches in the city so lost to be rebuilt in the uh, 16 in the, in the, at the end of the 17th century and it was then had a renewed life a church built by Sir Christopher Wren and but it was blitzed in 1940 in December 1940 and the uh, walls remained standing and the tower but most of the rest of the church was lost and you can see some extraordinary photographs of what it looked like after the bombing and this church that you're now sitting in was rebuilt the last of the churches to be rebuilt after the Blitz. And so St. Andrew by the Wardrobe is a great survivor. And the church is very beautiful, but some of the fittings and some of the uh, underlying aspects of it are now in need of very significant repair. And one of the reasons why those of you watching online, we've got the lovely sunshine, which is pouring in and making uh, actually our faces very bright at the moment. Uh, those sitting in the church are in slightly more shadow and some of our lights are not working because the electrics are beginning to go and we need to relight the church in a more modern way anyway. And we're also hoping that uh, the heating system, which was a wonderful and radical underfloor heating system, uh, which is broke, broke down about 15 years ago, uh, can be uh, renewed no longer with a, with a new greener heating system uh, using heat exchangers in the roof, which will hopefully mean that the church will over the next 10 years as the supply moves onto a greener basis, become carbon neutral over the next decade, which would be a wonderful thing for us to achieve. And so it is that uh, uh, we've got a big project on, a 
and part of the displays is our consultation on that. And those of you here, please do, before you go, uh, grab hold of the consultation sheet and fill it in and stick it in the box. And if you are watching online, please do go to our website where you can fill, it, fill that in. And uh, uh, we are looking to raise 1.1 million. And so uh, if you have 1.1 million, please would you see me afterwards. And if you have less than that, please would you still see me afterwards because it'll still do. And uh, I'm very serious about the, uh, the, the need for us to, to raise funds. And uh, so do please, if you're able to help us, or know someone who might be able to help us uh, with the fundraising, please do uh, be in touch with me or with uh, after uh, uh, Tessa and Carol of our fundraising team uh, here uh, amongst us uh, in, in the church. And again, you can contact us and them through the website. I'm whiffling, and I know when archbishops, because archdeacons work with bishops all the time, I can feel the archbishop saying, would he stop whiffling and let us get on with our conversation? Absolutely never. Eminence, never. it's wonderful to have you with us. I'm going to wear, for the first time, in our tradition in the, in the, in the Anglican Church, only bishops wear pectoral crosses. But I'm not asserting a, 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 anything above my station, but I'm wearing a cross that uh, uh, the um, archbishop gave me uh, when he came on a very special visit here um, just about a year ago, wasn't it, Eminence? I'm so grateful to you for giving me this cross. And uh, I'm, I'm going to wear it now while we're having our conversation um, around, uh, uh, around the work, because we're hoping to build a, a marvellous partnership with the Coptic Orthodox Church in, uh, in London, and that uh, the work of the church would uh, be uh, uh, centred in some ways here. And we're going to talk about that and how that partnership is going to unfold. Uh, over the next half an hour. Or so. you, you can, can please do. It. Yes. Thank you. So this is uh, years of expertise, and it's sometimes the simple solutions <laughs> that work. Eminence, were you ever an archdeacon? <laughs> I don't think I, I, I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> Eminence, I think in your in your tradition, the archdeacon is always a deacon. Is that right? So when I first came to the UK. Um, I understood many things very quickly, but one of the things that took me years to understand is what an archdeacon does. Uh, because in, 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 a, in our setting, we don't have the equivalent. So the archdeacon's role would be run by a hegemon, a senior priest. Mm. But the fact that the archdeacon has this administrative role and who is also a priest doesn't really exist in our tradition. And yet as, as time went on, I understood the prominence of the role of the archdeacon and the incredible assistance the Archdeacon gives to the Arsene Bishop. Mm. And um, I mean, Father Luke is no exception, I think, especially, and I really must um, pay incredible respect, especially over these past 18 months. So we, we've been friends for a long time, we've dealt mm. with each other for a long time, but especially over these last 18 months and what London has been going through, uh, Archdeacon Luke. Uh, has been on many of the consultative bodies, not only representing the Church of England in London, but also uh, representing all of us as churches and representing faith communities with consultations, uh, with, with uh, legislative bodies and, and local and national government. And he have really has been a stabilizing uh, presence because we've had meeting after meeting after meeting where we've been brought up to speed with what's going on. It's very easy for us, you know, being, being, being a, a, a state church, a prominence to the Church of England to have all this information and us constantly playing catch up, but actually we've never ever meant, been made to feel that way. So thank you for that, Father. And thank you for the incredible leadership role you've shown throughout London and with almost every call I've been with you, whether it's the Metropolitan Police or Public Health England or any other bodies. Um, it is not only I who hold Father Luke in such esteem, but he's much appreciated by many. So thank you. Eminence, you're enormously kind and uh, thank you. For, and thank you for all the work that you and your community have been doing and all of that as well. Talking about your community, um, I understand that the Coptic church is an Egyptian church and uh, um, and the, the word cop comes from the ancient Egyptian language, which you still use in your liturgy, is that? Absolutely. So the word that? Coptic, just means Egyptian, it comes from ancient Greek, Egyptus, Egypt. Um, and, and very much, you know, most people are going to be more aware of Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox. It just makes more sense. Coptic Orthodox just means Egyptian Orthodox. And there's, there's a funny story I share constantly, and that is 
Um, it tells you why I take great care in explaining this. I was traveling to one of our parishes and stopped at services to refuel my car. And there was a gentleman there with a rucksack and a sign trying to get a lift somewhere. And um, he said, uh, good morning, Padre. And I said, good morning. And he said, um, so which church do you belong to? And I thought, you know, it's too early and I'm in too much of a rush to explain what Coptic means and Greek paradigm with the Russians. So I said, I'm Egyptian Orthodox. He said, oh, so you're Coptic. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out he was a lapsed theologian um, who had heard about the Coptic church. So Coptic just means Egyptian. Uh, Christianity was established in Egypt in the middle of the first century, about 55 AD by St. Mark, the writer of the gospels. And um, we have had an unbroken presence of Christian life and witness in Egypt since then. Uh, and as an apostolic church, we can trace our roots way right back to that time. So St. Mark would have been the first patriarch. Mm -hmm. The current head of the church, His Holiness Pope Teodras II, is the 118th Pope of Alexandria and Patriarch of St. Mark. So basically, we can trace that heritage all the way back to St. Mark in the first century. And uh, the Coptic Orthodox Church Christians in Egypt remain uh, the largest Christian denomination until now in the Middle East, factoring sadly for about 80% of all Christians in the Middle East now, because so many other Christian communities from countries like Libya, Iraq, Syria, the Palestinian territories have left. So the bulk of Christians are still in Egypt. That's an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And, the, and it's been a, such a sorrow to see the persecution of the churches uh, and the uh, am I right? Oriental Orthodox is that a group sort of noun for all of those churches taken together, or is that is that a mis misunderstanding? No. So Orthodoxy, uh, there are two families of Orthodox. For, for those, I'm sure you know this, but I'll just brush up your knowledge of Orthodoxy. There are two families of Orthodoxy: uh, the Eastern Orthodox family and the Oriental Orthodox family. The Eastern Orthodox would be the Byzantine Orthodox, so it'd be the Greek, Russian, Serbian, all of the Eastern European churches. There are 15 churches in that family. And then there's the Oriental Orthodox Church, the Oriental Orthodox family of which we are a member. And that incorporates the um, Coptic Orthodox, Armenian, Syrian, Eritrean, and Indian Orthodox churches. Uh, and that is the other family. So, but in principle, we have the same faith. Practice differs due to culture and ethnicity. Uh, theologically, we're, we're the same. We've been divided over centuries because of linguistics. Yes. Uh, but we are working on that at the moment. But yes, you're right. We're members of the, the Coptic Orthodox Church will be one of the Oriental family churches. Because I can ask you about particular um, Orthodox positions and theolo theologies and so on. And because uh, when, as a, an Anglican theological student, and uh, I was, um, remember being uh, taught about uh, uh, um, monothelitism and monophysism and so on. And, but the, these um, were particular theological positions around the, 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 the nature of Christ. Um, but I think that the, the modern, or the, in, the, in the last few centuries, the ecumenical movement and, the, and ecumenical theology has, as you say, rather nuanced those positions away from the, 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 the sharp distinctions that used to be there. Is, is, is that right? We are working on that. So, so if we look at the major difference. The first split of the church was at the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon. Now, the church in the first centuries was the one holy universal church. And until now, in every one of our services, we pray for the one holy universal church, mm. all of us as the body of Christ. Up until 451 <clears throat> AD, which was the Council of Chalcedon, there were no denominations. It was one church with bishops and at the Council of Chalcedon, we were accused of being monophysite, yes. which means believing in one nature of Christ. Of course, that was a misnomer because the fathers of our church, people like the great Saint Athanasius, Saint yes. Cyril, the theologian, spoke about both the divinity of Christ, but it's also the humanity of Christ, mm. and that they were inseparable. Uh, Saint Cyril, in his uh, great um, explanation said it was like 
heated iron. Yes. Where if the iron was heated on a fire and became red hot, you could no longer divide the heat from the iron. And that was the incarnate word of God. That was the incarnate word where you had the humanity and divinity together. Theologically, as St. Cyril said, separated in thought alone, because our, our thinking is, is, is limited. Mm -hmm. So in thought alone, we make this distinction. But in reality, it was the one incarnate word of God in that one nature. And so, of course, we can't be monophysite because we don't believe in only one of those. But there is a term that in Syria used himself, which is meophysite. Okay. So in Greek, mono means one and only one. Mea can be one composite nature, so one made of two. So in, in his own words, it was mea physis to theologus sarcomen, which is the one nature for God, the word in the flesh. Mm. And, and, and that resolves it now. And so we are mea physis, not monophysite. Interesting. And uh, you may well be aware of this, and I don't know whether you have the same thing, but Western Rite bishops um, were quite often blessed with two fingers, but together as a symbol of the two natures and, and held together. So if you see a bishop blessing like this, then this is, uh, this is the, the outward symbol of that. And you sometimes see those on pictures of, uh, of uh, and, and statues of bishops as well. So, um, I wondered just to take us place in the church today in the numbers that you have and so on. So what, what is the life of the, uh, the Coptic Orthodox Church today? I mean, clearly you're here in London. There are a large proportion of the, of the churches in, in Egypt. Are there other communities elsewhere in the world? Are you, uh, and, and are there lots of, lots of communities here in, in, in London and in the UK? So the Coptic Orthodox Church is, is in a very specific position as, as far as other Christian communities in the Middle East here, in that um, we don't use the word diaspora. So yeah. communities outside of Egypt are not diaspora communities, they are migrant communities. And that's because a diaspora is a dispersion. It is where there is, as we saw, let's say with the Armenian communities, yes. because with the great, you know, the Holocaust, the, yes. the, 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 uh, the great persecution, they were dispersed. Mm. Whereas for us, um, we believe that 90% of Coptic Christians are still in Egypt. Mm. So the number of Coptic Christians outside of Egypt is only about 10%. Um, and that represents in Egypt about 15 million Coptic Christians, about 15% mm. of the population. Um, it is still a, a thriving, dynamic community. Um, the life of our churches and our monasteries, the life of our communities. Sunday school is an incredible part of who mm. we are. We just celebrated the centenary of our Sunday school movement. Ah, wonderful. And that's almost as old as ours. It, yes. Well, well, well it, it, mm -hmm. I think it was because the, the, the missions, when they came to yeah, Egypt, would have, brought the... would have brought some of that concept. And it was taken mm. on and, of course, tweaked to, to, to suit our own theology and practice. Mm but it became a core mm. uh, ingredient of, of who we are today. We are all uh, an outcome of the Sunday School movement. We've all contributed, we've all served, yes. we've all been served. And so that sense of pastoral connection is very important for mm. us. So we still have a very strong pastoral connection with our communities. Um, I, Surprisingly, I've been here for 25 years. The first four years, I was here as a monk priest. Then I became a bishop 20, 21 years ago. Um, but I still do very basic um, pastoral work. Mm. I still do visitations. Every one of our members has my mobile number. That's the way we, we tend to, to yeah. work. Here in Britain, we have 33 parishes across the whole world, kingdom, four nations. Uh, including the Republic of Ireland. Um, and we have about 30,000 faithful. The vast majority of our community would be um, present in Greater London and the South of England, where we have probably, I would say, 50 to 60% of the community. And when I came to worship with you on one occasion at St. Mary Le Beau, I was struck with the diversity of the community, all respects, age, background, um, 
lots of people, Egyptian people, but lots of people not Egyptians and so on. You're clearly a community that's growing uh, in all sorts of ways. Well, we're very open, I think, because of the persecution we've, we've faced mm. over, and the persecution we've faced was ever since we were established. So our first martyr was St. Mark himself, yes. who was dragged through the streets of Alexandria. Um, we don't have that sense of exclusive ethnicity. Of course, mm. we're Egyptian, uh, we're proud to be Egyptian, but because of that persecution, um, identity became more ecclesial. Yes. And that is then transferable wherever we are. Which think, means that when we come here, we can worship in English and it's not a problem. Yeah, that's very interesting because I, I think something you've said in the past has been that, uh, that our persecutors don't look at our differences, they just see that we're all Christians. And uh, that, that's struck me very deeply. As a, and I think that for those of us who are not directly persecuted in that way, um, the voice of the church in persecution is an extraordinarily important one, and one which we do well to remember. There are all these studies and things that say that Christianity is the most persecuted of all the world faiths, and that uh, there's a, a real danger to being a Christian as, as a mollycoddled Western Christian who's lived a very comfortable Christian life and so on. That's a real challenge to me, I think, to recognise that my brothers and sisters are facing persecution. And I, I wonder what you think that the church in persecution has to say any say further to those like me who live a comfortable Christian life and find it terribly easy and therefore I can fade into the background and not have to face the 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 the, the, the danger of being a Christian. Well it's always been my my firm view and my conviction that we should never separate the church, even from the church in persecution and the church otherwise, or the church in church in the West, because mm. We all carry our cross differently. Yeah. I mean, you carry your cross here in your ministry in particular ways because we face different challenges in Britain as we serve mm. together. And I think we would do that very similarly. Yeah. My brother bishops in, in, in Egypt would carry the cross in a different way. Um, one thing I've seen and I'm very encouraged by over the past years, especially the past five to 10 years, is a greater understanding of the universality of the church Mm. And the fact that we are now feeling each other's pain and sharing each other's joy. Yeah. And that we realize that the persecution of one part of the body is a persecution of the whole body. Yeah. A rejoicing of one part of the body is a rejoicing of the whole body. And I think, I think someone said that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and and that's, that, that, that is really the core of what we should be living in. Yes. Um, and I think when we, when we live that way, there's then no discrepancy. And, and what I felt being here in, in England for the past 25 years is an incredible commonality with everyone I've met, from yourself, mm. you know, other colleagues, we've, we've, and we're, we're very engaged ecumenically, as you know. Yes. But I feel that we can stand on common ground and do things together, mm. it, whether it's for here or when something happens, we then speak together for those persecuted in other parts of the world. Yes. And I think that's incredibly important. And I think that we, we've seen that in all sorts of ways. I'm very struck by what you say about how we bear our cross in the place where we, and that the Lord gives us a, a, a different cross, depending on our own circumstance. And uh, I think uh, the, the challenge for us is to how to be faithful um, is, is, is perhaps sometimes different, but nevertheless, it's the same underlying thing that we must, that we must do. And I think just on that as well, we also know that God is faithful and fair. And so he gives us grace in proportion to what we need to deal with. Yes. So, you know, years ago, we saw the 21 martyrs on the beach in London, uh, beach in London, sorry, beach in Libya. Yes. Um, and, you know, in those distinctive orange beach jumpsuits, country. and you'd think, how could they possibly have that courage? Mm. Well, it's because God's grace gave them the courage they needed then. Just as, and our Lord was very clear that you should not worry about what you say or what to speak, for the Holy Spirit will at that time give you words, yes. but He will also give us strength and courage. And that's the conviction and the comfort we have in our Christian faith. That's absolutely right. And, and, I, and I think also the, it's, the, it's the, the challenge to, uh, to faithfulness and to confidence, isn't it? That uh, uh, one can try to be confident in oneself, so to plan what to say, to work it all out, to try to stir up a sense of, 
of, of courage in a persecution that one's not facing, uh, but then perhaps not be ready for to be open to God's grace in the thing that one is facing. That's great. And your work here, Eminence, I mean, we are hoping to build a partnership together. And um, well, I mean, here is St. Andrew by the wardrobe, a very beautiful and very wonderful city church. I would say that, wouldn't I? But why do you feel that? I mean, beyond the obvious. And um, why here? Um, and why, why now? So can I overstep a bit and correct you on one thing? I don't think we're building a relationship. I think we already have a relationship. And I think we already have a shared vision because the time, the number of times we have stood side by side mm. and shoulder to shoulder on things in London, yes, for Christians and non-Christians alike, mm. is important. So I think this step wouldn't have happened if we didn't have that relationship and yeah. partnership. And I know that for a fact. I'm very thankful for it. I know this is a pioneering step, and I know it would not have been taken if that trust didn't already exist. Yes. But now God gives us the opportunity to build on it. And why do I think this place is important? Is First of all, it's a consecrated house of God, mm. and it has served for centuries, and it has served faithfully for centuries. And as you, you, you so rightfully said at the beginning, it's it's resilient. Yes, you know, it's knocked back and it's gotten up again, and it's knocked back and it's gotten up again, and it continues to serve, and it continues to be a place of prayer until today, and a place of hope, which is what we, we need to present. But also because London is, has such a, a rich history of Christian worship and faith. And this is one of the places, it's not a monument, it's not, it's not a museum, it's actually a place that has seen that life and witness over centuries. And so we're, we're stepping into that. You know, we say it in Egypt, but also here in England, you can walk into a place like this and you smell the history. Yes. You smell the incense, you know, and especially this is, you know, the way worship is done here. It, you smell the heritage mm. and, the, and you feel the prayers. And I think that has been incredibly significant. One other thing that is also an incredible bonus is that, uh, as I've been told, that this was the, the parish church of William Shakespeare. Awesome. And, you, you, and you, you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> and one thing that, that really encouraged me is that we want to have an open door policy. Every time I've come here, except especially before COVID, of course, every time I've come here, there have been school groups or tourist groups that have come in to see the place. And of course, some of them are coming in to see a church. Many of them are coming in to see a place where William Shakespeare would have stood. But Christians being opportunists, and we all are, and we all must be, we will take that. Absolutely. And if we receive people with a smile, with grace, and present Christ to them as they visit, you know, the place of William Shakespeare, that's an incredible witness. And it shows that the church is not isolated. It's not a fortress. It is a place of refuge where everyone is welcome. And we do not separate ourselves from culture. Mm -hmm. We do not separate ourselves from history. We are part of it. We are, we are an ingredient. We are, we are the salt of the earth. And that's how we must continue to live. I must, must tell you a story, which I, I, I delight to tell. Um, we had a, a gathering a bit like this a few years ago now uh, to focus on William Shakespeare and the history, his history in this area. And uh, we had an eminent speaker to come and talk to us about the uh, history of William Shakespeare and his religious history and the whole thing about whether he was or wasn't actually a Roman Catholic and his, um, his the Catholicism that comes through his, his work. Uh, and we, we have the, um, the, the, this, uh, the, the, the communion plate uh, that was given to St. Anne's Blackfriars, which is just over that way and was built on the site of the Blackfriars Monastery and where on Thursday, tomorrow, Thursday, on Thursday, we at 12.30, we, we have a mass in the churchyard there uh, on St. Anne's Day. Uh, and we have lots of people come. And uh, opportunities, rather. And, uh, um, but uh, we've got the communion plate. And of course, I said, well, this church was built right next door to Shakespeare's playhouse, Blackfriars Playhouse. Uh, it was very much in the right behind the 
the, the place where he lived. He almost certainly must have made his communion from it. Here is a, a relic of Shakespeare, says I. And the, uh, uh, the speaker said, well, actually, uh, the Archdeacon was completely wrong about this because uh, St. Anne's Blackfriars was planted into uh, that corner of the town because it was just beyond the city limit. And therefore, that's why you could have a playhouse and lots of other naughty things going on in that area. And the church was planted there as a very puritanical church to try to stop all of this uh, outrageous behaviour. And uh, that uh, Shakespeare, who was a much sort of more um, loose, light-hearted, cavalier, Catholic type, would have come here to St. by the Wardrobe, um, which is then is now a little bit more Anglo-Catholic. And of course, the uh, communion place, unfortunately, from here, from that period, no longer uh, is with us. But uh, let's... Father, as we um, come to the end of our conversation, and uh, as, but let's look forward a bit. And um, if we were to look forward five years, um, what might our best hopes be for where we might be in our partnership and in our work together? We have quite an extensive um, array of Christian ministry, as, as you know, starting from um, youth ministry, university campus ministry, ministry for the homeless. We have a retired and semi-retired ministry. Mm. Um, we have a variety of things that we do that this place will become a home for and a hub for. And uh, it will mean that being so close to the city, and, and I'm hoping over time things in the city start becoming what they were, um, we, can, we can provide a haven, a place of worship uh, for people who want to come and experience God. Um, in the middle of their day, at the beginning of their day, at the end of their day, to be able to do what our Lord has said and be a light that shines before all, not so that they could, you know, congratulate yourself or me or our churches, mm. but that they may glorify our Father in heaven. Mm. And I think that's what it's about. That's what we're trying to do here. We are trying to serve to the best of our capacity with whatever we have. You know, the widow's two mites, mm -hmm. we, we will use those. And we will do what we can. And as St. Paul also said, it is not I, but Christ who lives in me. Not to present ourselves, but to present our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of, the, I think the foundational ethos of all our outreach ministry here has been, and I made this very clear to our outreach and evangelism team, mm. we are not here to promote the Coptic Orthodox Church. We are here to present Christ from a yes. Coptic Orthodox perspective. Yes. This is how we experience him. This is how we worship him. This is how we love him. This is how we know him. And and I think that's incredibly important. And that what that's what makes our position very different to other things that happen in the world. Mm. The world promotes itself. Um, again, if we go back to scripture and what St. John the Baptist said about him having to decrease, our Lord having to increase. Yes. And it's only when we decrease, we, we stop being the cloud that hides the light of Christ. And I think that's incredibly important. So. By God's grace, in five years or 10 years or whatever it is, however God wants to use us, I think we will just try to be good and faithful students. Thank you. And working with you, we hope that our stewardship will flourish together. And as you have said, um, rather than suggesting that the church is many different things, um, it's one thing because we all together proclaim Christ too. And one of the things I often say in the ecumenical work and prayer that I do is that uh, the best way of trying to come close to one another is actually for all of us to get close to Christ, because then like the uh, spokes of a wheel, then uh, we gather together with him and mm -hmm. uh, he will lead us. Eminence, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been marvellous once again to be with you and to, to, to share a little. Um, the environment that we've got um, doesn't make it easy for us to do questions to involve those of you who are online. Um, but um, if there was anything from the floor that anybody wanted to chip in, uh, then now would be a moment. And then we will 
um, wind the conversation up and uh, uh, those of us that are here uh, may, perhaps can we would like to we can gather in the narthex but is there anything that anybody would like to ask either of us or, or chip in at this point silence fell with a resounding crash i think we can also ask kareem who's doing the technology kareem if someone posts a question in the chat, chat yes, please yes. feel free to read it out to us yes sure we'll do his your eminence thank you does that mean you understood everything or absolutely nothing it's, 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 it could go either way kareem is there anything in the chat uh, nothing for now well, Eminence, thank you very much indeed. And uh, brothers and sisters, thank you all very much. Would you pray for us as we close the, as we close our conversation? Thank you. But before I do, I just want to say, I've been so looking forward to this evening. It's just, I, I mm. honestly didn't want it to end, but thank you, Father, for the opportunity. Thank you all for being here as well. It's just so, it's so lovely to be in the presence of people again. I think we're mm. all done with screens and monitors. Uh, no disrespect to people out there, of course, um, but it means that people out there can join us from all over the world. And I do know some people join us from around the world. That's well. wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to thank you again, Father, for your for your fellowship and your partnership and everything you've done to 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 move this process along. And of course, to the church here, to the, the church wardens, the, the, the church council here, everyone who's contributed, uh, to the staff here, to the volunteers. We've felt nothing but being home. And the spirit of service is one that we hope to continue to carry through with you as well. Well, thank you very much indeed. And the work that we're doing with you, I think, is, uh, is, is very important. And thank you and your team as well for all that, all that you've done for us. And, uh, and the, uh, just before handing over to you, just one last story, which is that it must have been, oh golly, because my youngest was only about eight, so it must have been about 13 years ago, uh, on the only occasion I've ever been to Egypt, but I remember going to Luxor and walking down and finding a new church that was being built there. Um, and uh, um, it was an extraordinary link with uh, an Anglo-Saxon story of conversion, because that church was full of little birds flying in and out as the building was being well, not yet finished. And so the windows hadn't been put in and things, and we wandered around, and it was uh, um, and, uh, almost as hot as it is, has been today. And um, you must know that extraordinary story of, uh, I think it was St Boniface, who um, was giving a, it was preaching to some unconverted Anglo-Saxons, and the bird flew in through the, uh, the Great Hall, and through the light and out the other side into the storm. And he said, that is the life of man and that the light of Christ is the light that guides us, and that uh, you, must, uh, you must look forward to something more than simply carousing in the hall, but going out into the light of Christ. And that together is what I think we're seeking to do, building Christ's church and leading people into his life. Thank you. Let's pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship and companionship. We thank you for allowing us to be gathered, whether here or around the world, as your body and in your love. Despite challenges and obstacles, Lord, you have continued to bind us together. We ask your blessings upon this place that hosts us, that it continues to be a place from which your light shines and breaks darkness, that tries to overwhelm. We ask your blessings upon all those gathered here, that you may guide and support and strengthen them and keep them safe. Your blessings fall upon your world, that your healing hand may be upon us all, granting healing of mind, body, and spirit, and that you may guide us to do your will, for the glory of your name, and for the service of your children. We ask this thing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Eminence, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us online.